helper, my, my good friend. Brandon's going to preach for us this morning. So come on up, Brandon, and share what God's put on your heart. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I don't know if you can trust your pastor's judgment anymore. He watched, uh, he watched my sermon on YouTube and still asked me to preach this morning. So, um, But I'm thankful for the opportunity, thankful to stand here before you guys. It's, uh, it's a humbling honor to be able to stand up here and attempt to share the Word of God. Um, uh, if you've never done it, if you've never witnessed to someone or, or, or shared the Word of God, it is something that is... Uh, when you're done, it is an honor, and you're just like, wow, I can't believe you used me like that, God, and, and it's awesome. So if you'll turn with me this morning, we're going to read from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, and then immediately after that, we're going to flip over to the book of Matthew chapter number 9. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, verses 5 and 6 says this, it says, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. This is Paul speaking here. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, he has made the light shine in our hearts so that we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that second verse, verse 6, one more time. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made the light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Those last two songs that we sang in worship this morning were talking about Oh, I want to see him and, and looking on the face of Jesus. And I know those, those songs were tailored to talk about that physical, that, that physical meeting in the end times whenever we're raptured and we're in heaven and we finally get to see the physical face of Jesus Christ. But I want to talk to us this morning about the spiritual face of Jesus Christ that we can see this morning. So, so go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 9. We're going to start reading in verse 18. Matthew chapter number 9, verse 18. We pick up here where Jesus is, is leaving the synagogue and He's going to, to raise from the dead this, this 12-year-old girl. While He was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before Him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him, and she touched the fringe of his robe. For she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And then probably one of the most powerful phrases in Scripture is right here in this verse. In, 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 in the New Testament Scripture, says this. It says, Jesus turned around. Jesus stopped what he was doing, stopped where he was going, stopped his mission for the day, and he turned around to look at this woman. And when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome day that we get to gather together as a corporate body and we get to worship you and we get to edify your name and we get to be built up by each other's faith, God, Lord, that as we're here together, Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint me to preach this word, that you would anoint our hearts to hear it, and that by the end of this day that we could know your face and we could see you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I have two kids. Um, I have a, a seven-year-old son, and I have a four-year-old daughter. So life is interesting. Life, you know, it's, uh, it's awesome. I love it. I love having the kids. But I was thinking this morning um, over some different instances that we've had with the kids. You know, I have great kids, but 
they are kids. So you have moments with them. And I was thinking back to a time whenever uh, my son, Gregor, he was, probably, he's probably, he was probably the age my daughter is now. He was four. And um, it was bath time. So put him in the bathtub. All right, Gregor, here's your water running it. And being the attentive father I am, I went and I sat down and started watching, um, I forget what show it was, but I went back and was watching TV because he knows to turn the water off. And then like, I don't know how long later it was, but all of a sudden I start hearing giggles and laughs and, uh uh-oh, that's not, that's not what I should be hearing at bath time. And I go in and the walls are just covered in water and the bathtub is at the at the brim, and we've been working on this. He, he knows to turn the water off, because I've told him to, and he knows how to. He's four, and all I could do was just come in and say, why? Why did, why did you not turn the water off? It's overflowing, and that's the answer you get, and it's like, what? The translation is, I'm four. You know, it's like, I don't know what to do. And, and in that moment, I could just feel myself, you know, responding. And my countenance was, you know, overbearing and looking over him and why. And, you know, I was so frustrated. And you could just see it in his face that, you know, the hurt. He was having just such a good time. And, and he couldn't understand why I was so upset with him. And, and then I kind of had to calm down and, and think about, it. okay, this is just water. I can turn it off. I can pull the drain out, I can let the water out, I can, um, I can, you know, clean this up with a towel and a mop, you know, it's not that big of a deal, don't do it again, son, you know, it's, uh, you know, one of those types of things, and, you know, I have this uh, little card that my, my daughter sent me, she, uh, she loves to draw, she, she loves it, and it doesn't always end up on a card, sometimes it ends up on walls, and sweetest little thing, she is so artistic and she wants to just express herself, but sometimes she doesn't have the right medium to express herself and it ends up on the wall. And same thing, why would you do that? I don't know. You know, that's, that's the answer. I don't know is not an answer. You know, and you, you know how, how we are. If you have children or if you've had children, you, you know this experience. You know where you come in and you just, why are you doing this? And, and they just don't know. They're, they're just children. So I got to thinking about this. And, and what it comes down to is when we're coming in like that and we're coming in all hot and heavy and, and ready to discipline, it's, it's our countenance on our face. And they see that something that's not that big of a deal, something that's not that crazy, that we're overreacting and they see our countenance and they see us in this judgmental, this judgmental look on our face and we're looking down at them and we're pointing at them and we're expressing how disappointed we are and they see it as children. They see the countenance on our face because the way our face is, the expressions that we have on our face speak louder than the words that we're saying. You know, whenever I come in and I say why like that, I, I'm not even for sure if it's a rhetorical question or not. You know, I'm just coming in. Why? And, and, and so I, I feel like as Christians, this is how we struggle with the teachings of the gospel and the teachings of the word of God, even though we've heard it preached and we, and we know that God is a loving God and a merciful God and a graceful God. When you, when you think about the face of God, what do you see? And I'm not trying to impose my struggles upon you, but a lot of times I see God looking at me in this uh, exasperated, why would you do that type of look? You know, like, how dumb can you be? I told you not to do it, and then you went ahead and you did it anyways. And, and it's how we relate to God, and it's how we see Him that a lot of times in our Christian walk, and, and, and maybe if you're, if you're not a Christian this morning, you've always pictured God being that, the, the, the old man sitting upstairs in heaven with a long beard and got lightning bolts in his hands and he's ready to, you know, that's, 
a, a pretty good picture of what the world sees, but a lot of times when we're saved and we're transformed and we've had our genesis and we've had our experience with Jesus, for whatever reason, that mindset doesn't ever really leave us. We're always sitting here and we're expecting that when God looks at us, He's going to, to judge us and He's going to be disappointed in us and that we're never going to live up to the standard of God. So we're going to come back and we're going to touch on that, but I want to talk about the face of Jesus here. Is In 2 Corinthians, we see that it is the glory of God is shown through the face of Jesus. This is a study in and of itself, and if you want to get into Hebrews chapter 1 and start reading through that, you're going to find out that as Pentecostals especially, we we have a, a wrong view of glory a lot of times, and that it really is the glory of God is Jesus Christ. So the glory is in the countenance of Jesus' face. When He looks at us, it says, He made... The light shine in our hearts so we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. And the the hard thing is, and and as a minister, and, and I've been a pastor before, as a Christian, I understand acceptance. That that's that's a that's a doctrine that that I'm okay with. Because because it's literally the message of the gospel. Jesus accepts us. Jesus loves us, that's why he came and he died for us. But the, the, the doctrine that I have trouble understanding a lot of times is the doctrine of approval. Is Jesus approving of who I am when I come to him? And, and I, I want to get this message across to you, and I don't want it to be confused with some other doctrines that are out there, but I want to tell you this morning that you are eternally, unconditionally approved by God. That there is nothing that you can do that will take away from the approval that God has of you. I'm not talking about eternal security and saying that you'll never sin again and that there's no chance that you can fall into sin again. That's, That's not what I'm trying to say this morning. But I want to preach to you this morning that God approves of who you are. There is no way that we can live up to God's standard as human beings. That's that's just not the case. But... uh, God, when He looks at us, we think of Him as this annoyed, like, ah, why are you doing that? You know, I, I accept who you are, and I love you. And I accept my children, and I love them. But sometimes they do things that, that annoy me. And now, as a parent, don't, don't put a guilt trip on me, because I know you do the same thing. So don't look at me like that. Sometimes, as, as a parent... You get annoyed and, and, and we think of God looking down at us and being annoyed with us and saying, why would you do that? And we come to church and we sit here on Sunday mornings and we know how our week has gone and we know what we've, what we've gone through that week and we know that we haven't lived up to the standard that God has set forth for us. And we come to church and we're just defeated and we don't want to get in and we don't want to, to participate because we know that if we get into the presence of God, those things will, will come out and God will be disappointed in us. God will be annoyed with us. So I'm just going to sit back I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to go to church because it's my duty to. It's my habit. It's my my ritual now. So I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to put on a good face. Everyone's going to look at me and everything's all right. But I'm not going to get close to God because I don't want Him to to judge me. I don't want Him to, to, to be annoyed with me. I don't want Him to be disappointed with me. So, But I want to talk about this, this glory so the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Glory is, is an interesting word. And, and, and simply put, here in, when we look in, in Hebrew, when we see like uh, Moses. Moses is probably one of the, the first instances that we see glory talked about. And he cries out to God. And he cries out in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. He says, Moses responded, then show me your glorious face. Show me your glorious presence. Show me your glory. I want to see your glory. When he's asking that, he's asking to see the essence of God. 
That's what glory means. Glory means essence. What is God made of? What is the essence of God here? And so Moses responds like that and says, God, show me your glory. Show me your glorious presence. And God responds, okay, I'll do that. Here's what I'll do. I'll make my judgment pass before you. No, that's, that's not what he said. He says, I'll make my wrath pass before you. No, I'll make my disappointment pass before you. No, he says, I will make my goodness pass before you. So Moses cries out, God, show me your glory. And God says, okay, let me show you my goodness. Let me show you how good I am, how great I am. Let me just show you how much I love you because that's who I am as your father. Yes, I have other attributes, and yes, there's other things, but I am good. When it comes down to it, God is good. And so when we see Jesus, we see the goodness of an almighty Father that is over everything. And how awesome and how powerful is that to see that a God that is over everything, an omnipotent God, an all-powerful, all-controlling God that has every right to be mad at me, decides to show me his goodness. Isn't that powerful stuff right there? So if we can see the face of Jesus Christ, we will have a profound revelation of who God really is. When we see the characteristics of Jesus, when he stops in the middle of his ministry, and whenever you look at a woman who's been dealing with issues, with, 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 a, with a female issue for 12 years, and a girl that is 12 years old that has her whole life in front of her that is dead, you would think God would prioritize that because look at this little girl. She's dead. He's going to do this. But he stops and he turns and he faces this woman. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm excited this morning. So we've talked about the glory. We've talked about what glory is and that it's the essence of God. But let's talk about the face for a moment. So in the Old Testament, the face was always a, uh, could always represent, was a metaphor of judgment. The face was a metaphor of the judgment. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you. So under the Mosaic law, under the, this, this law, and a lot of us, when we just think of the Mosaic law, we just think of the Ten Commandments, but it was so, so, so much more than that. You have the book of Numbers and Leviticus and, and, and the part of Exodus that's devoted to just going over every intricate part of the law and the purpose of the law. And, and I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but it's important to understand this. The, 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 the purpose of the law was to point out our sin. Because there's no way that we can live up to the fullness of the law because the law represents the perfectness and holiness of God. So the whole entirety purpose of law was to point us to Jesus Christ and to let us know that, hey, you're human and you can't do this. You'll never be good enough on your own accounts. That's why I'm giving you Jesus. So that's the purpose of the law. So under the Mosaic law, whenever the, the, the Israelites would sin, God would turn his back on them. Turn his face away from them. When he was pleased with them, he would turn his face on them and his face would be there and they would see God's face and that was his acceptance and his approval of their actions. But his face turned away from them was his disapproval. His unacceptance, not accepting that behavior. Showing his disappointment. So when we, when we see this, his face represents approval and acceptance, the face of Jesus. We are perpetually and eternally approved by God. I want to get this, home, uh, get this point home to you. I'll probably say it again, that there is nothing that can take away the approval of God towards us. Isaiah chapter 54, and this is a prophetic, this is a prophetic scripture right here. 
In a surge of anger, this is God speaking to Isaiah, in a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Again, this is a prophecy, a prophecy of redemption. A redemptive prophecy of God saying, this is how it is now, but I am going to redeem you, and I'm going to make you right, and I'm going to make you whole with me once again. It says, to me, this is like, this is still God speaking. It says, to me, this is like in the days of Noah, when I swore the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. The Noahic covenant, the, the covenant that he made with Noah, is an eternal covenant, and if you don't believe me, as this rain starts to clear up, if it's sunny outside, go outside and look up and look for that rainbow that was a symbol of God's eternal promise that His judgment would never visit earth like that again until earth was done. Until it was time for us to be gone and, and His wrath is meted out on us at that, on earth at that point, God's promise is, is that He will not judge us like that again. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you. So he's saying just as powerful as, and eternal as my promise was to Noah that I will not flood the earth again, just as powerful and eternal is my promise with you that I will never be angry with you. Wow. I've sworn to never be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So I want to stop here for just a minute, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the love of Jesus. Because when God looks at you, He says, in my anger for a moment I turned my face away, but now I'm looking back at you again and I'm showing you that I love you and that I accept you and that I approve of who you are no matter what you do. And, and if you have any doubt, Doubts like that, you will see a mountain fall down. You will see the hills be removed before my love ever fades for you. I will never be angry with you again. I will never rebuke you again because I love you. And that is a promise that will stand past the, the foundations of the earth. When the foundations of the earth are gone, God's love and approval for who you are will still be here will still be in existence, and God will eternally love you, and He's eternally made this covenant to us. I know I'm getting excited this morning, but that's how powerful this message is, is that it's not just words to be spoken, but that is something passionate in my heart because I felt that. I, I experienced that on, on, on a weekly basis where I, I come before God and I'm, Okay, God, lay it on me. I know I deserve it. Judge me. You know what has never happened? That. Because God loves us. So, to the man who... who dared to ask God to show him his glory. In the book of Numbers, God talks to Moses and he tells him, he says, whenever you meet, whenever you have a church service, and this was after he had appointed pastors or leaders to be over the people, he says, whenever you have a corporate gathering and, and, and you and you minister to the people and you speak my words. You, you've come out of the, the house of meeting and, and you've stepped out and you've preached your message to them. I want you to close every service like this. That's what he tells them. And he says, I want you to, to give this blessing to your people. The Lord bless you and keep you. And if you, if you want to read along, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. I'm going to read through it quickly so you don't have to flip there but if you want to read it later. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. Verse 26, again, we see it again, so it must be important. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you His peace. So that phrase right there, if you look, look it up and, and look at the definition there in the Hebrew, it literally means to smile with approval. So when God turns His face on you and He looks at you, that shining that's coming from His face, and He, and he gives you His peace through His face, He's smiling on you with His approval. And... In that same scripture, in, in Exodus chapter 33, when, when Moses calls out to God and he says, show me your glory, and God says, okay, I'll, I'll let my goodness pass before you, uh, we, we, we see God is, is kind of stuck in this conundrum, this, this uh, dispensational rock in a hard place. He says, okay, Moses, you've asked me a question and I want to give you an answer, but if, if you see my face, I'll kill you. If, uh, if, if you look on my face right now, I, you'll die. There, there's, there's no way around that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to hide you in this rock, and I'm going to cover it up, and I'm going to walk past. I'm going to walk past it, and then I'm going to remove my hand, and I'm going to let you see my hinder parts because I don't want you to fall over dead. I want you to be able to tell people about my glory. So in, in, in uh, chapter 33 of Exodus, in verses uh, 22, As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. He, he, he looked at Moses and basically saying, Okay, Moses, you're asking some New Era questions. You're, you're asking me some New Testament stuff here. But we're in the Old Testament still. We're in the Old Era. So I can't let you see my face, but I'm going to share my glory with you a little bit so you can get a taste. So you can tell my people about my glory. So they can get excited about it. So they can look forward to it. So they won't be stuck just looking into the law and seeing how bad they are, but looking forward to the day when they'll see my face and see the fullness of my glory. I've heard a lot of New Testament Christians, and I brought this up earlier, especially a lot of Pentecostals, saying, I want to have an experience like Moses had. I want to see the glory of God. God, show me your glory. I just want to see the hinder parts of your glory. I don't want the same experience that Moses had. Why do I need to see the hinder parts of God's glory when I can look full in the face of Jesus Christ and I can see the fullness of the glory of God where I can see the law has been fulfilled, where I can see where Jesus took my place and I can look into His eyes and He can look into mine and we have a relationship. I don't want a relationship with God where all I can see is just the hinder parts because I'm afraid of what will happen to me if I look into His face. That's not the type of relationship I want to have with my God. I want to look into His face and know that I see the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. But Brandon, God hates sin. You're right. God can't live in the same place where sin is, so how can He approve of me if I fall? How can He approve of me if I, if I mess up? Because God can't live in the same place as sin can. You're absolutely right. God hates sin. God cannot coincide with sin. God will not double date with sin. God will not share us with sin. You are 100% correct. But God hates sin so much that He sent His Son to be crushed. That He sent His Son to be beaten, to be bruised, to, to, to be cut so bad, to be bloody that some theologians believe that you would not be able to tell the difference between Jesus and a wild animal that was skin hanging on the pole. That's how much God hates sin. But the good news of that, the Gospel is a good news. It's not good news, bad news. God doesn't come to us and say, all right, which one would you like first? Would you like the good news or the bad news? The good news is, I love you, but the bad news is, I'm going to have to punish you today. That's not the gospel. The gospel is just simply good news. And when Jesus did that, when Jesus went to the cross, He died for my sins, past, present, and future. 
We'll say that again. When he died on the cross, he died for my sins, past, present, and future. His forgiveness was immediate when he died on that cross. When he sacrificed himself, his, his, uh, his forgiveness for our sins was immediate. That's why the Bible says that a righteous man can fall seven times and rise back up again. Because his righteousness is not earned, it is imputed. It's given unto us. And so now we're in this theology here, and I kind of want to touch back on Exodus 33. I know it seems like I'm jumping a little bit. But when he says he hides him in the crevice of the rock, Jesus Christ is that rock of ages, right? And so here we are, Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Amen? So when he died for us, he became our righteousness for us and he clothed us in his righteousness and he covered us in his righteousness. So when God looks at you and he looks at me, he doesn't see you in me, he sees Jesus. Has God ever been mad at Jesus? The answer is no, if, if you're wondering. God has never been mad at Jesus. God has never punished Jesus. Jesus came on His own volition, came on His own free will, and says, I'm going to take the punishment for sin upon Myself. God isn't doing this to Me. God isn't mad at Me. Uh, on the cross, God does turn His face away from Him because He can't coincide with the same place as sin. But God has never been mad at Jesus. So why would He be mad at us? Why would He be disappointed in us? Why would He have this outlook of disappointment and disapproval on Him when we are hidden in Jesus Christ? We're living in that new era. We're no longer under this Old Testament law, under this Old Testament idea that we can't look on the face of God because we're so impure that we'll die. Jesus came and He changed that. The moment He died on the cross, that was fulfilled. The law was fulfilled and we don't have to worry about looking on His face. We see it even in the temple when it happened the veil that covered up the holiest of holies where no man could enter in, even the high priest. He could only go in once a year, and if he hadn't any sin in his life, he would die. They tied a rope around him so they could pull him back out. That was rent wide open because God says, I want you to look on my face and know that I love you. And I've been wanting to tell you that for a long time. I've been wanting you to look into my face so I could have a relationship with you for all of eternity. Since the moment I created man, I've had this plan in place because I knew you would mess up. I knew you would fail me. I knew you wouldn't be able to live up to my glory. But I created a plan where we could be made right with one another. So we, we remove ourselves from Moses in this Old Testament law and we step back thousands of years later. Jesus is ministering in the temple and He's, he's preaching and He's on His way to, to, to minister to a 12-year-old girl. And it's interesting, if you look at this, He's going to minister to a 12-year-old girl and then He helps a woman, stops and help, helps a woman with a 12-year-old infirmity. In Scripture, the, 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 the number 12 is a picture of divine authority, divine government. So it's almost as if Jesus is taking this conglomeration of events here and He's saying, I, I'm in charge now. I'm the King of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. And I'm going to establish a new reign and it's going to be totally different this time around. He's saying you're no longer underneath the kingdom of sin, but you're underneath the kingdom of God. And we see this woman. She'd had this flow of blood, this female issue for 12 years. She was a lawbreaker. She was breaking the law by being in that crowd that day. 
She was risking everything. At the very best, according to the law, she was to be isolated. She wasn't to be communicated with. She could be imprisoned. And at the worst, underneath the law, she could be stoned for being there because she was ceremonially unclean according to the law. But yet she said, if I can just touch the hinder part, bottommost part of his robe, I'll be healed. And so she began to approach God. And she was, I can only imagine that she was nervous. And, and, and actually the Bible says after she touched him, she was shaking with fear. So she, she approaches God in this humble sort of, I'm going to risk it, but I'm afraid of what's going to happen. And she touches him, and she steps back, and she knows she's healed. She got what she came for, and Jesus stops. And if you look in the book of Mark under the account there, it says three different times that he was looking around. So Jesus stopped looking. Who touched me? Who, who, who touched the, the, my robe? Who came up and approached the backside of my glory and touched my robe? And it says the woman was shaking with fear. But Jesus turned around and He looks at her and they lock eyes. She's afraid because she's just committed a sin. She has just broken the law. And by every law, Jesus being a full rabbi underneath the, the, the Jewish religion, He could have her stoned in that moment and He would be completely justified. That's how we approach God with our problems a lot of times. God, I, I, I'm broken. God, I, I'm sick on the inside. This, this disease, this human nat this disease of human nature, this sin that, that comes to me, this, this physical infirmity doesn't even have to be sin, really. Because a lot of times we, we equate sin with, it is equated with the fall in Genesis. Sickness, death, physical sin and death, they came because sin came. And so even when it comes to asking God for simple things like healing, we're afraid to go to Him because why do we have this sickness in our body? Did I sin? Did I, did I upset God? Is that why I got this infirmity? We, all these questions go through our head, but Jesus turned around and He looked at her and then He said these words. And, and, and the words that He said, they can't even be said with a scowl on the face because He looks at her, He turns around, He makes eye contact with her, and He says, Woman, get out of here. No, that's not what he says. He looks at her and he says, Daughter, be encouraged. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the King James Version says, Be of good cheer. He smiles at her and he says, Daughter, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. Why? Because your faith has made you well. Amen. This morning, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can stand encouraged this morning. You can be happy because Jesus has already turned around. We're not approaching the backside of God. We're not approaching the backside of His glory. Jesus has already stopped. He's, he's not walking away from us anymore. He's standing here with His face towards us, arms open wide, waiting for us to come to Him. Daughter, be encouraged. Son, be encouraged. He didn't even distance. He, he, he made it relational. In that moment, we're not just people to Him. We're sons and we're daughters. Amen? Stand with me this morning. I hope I've been able to communicate this message to you. The message that we are eternally, perpetually, unconditionally approved and accepted by a loving Savior. 
who died for us. The Bible tells us, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's the message this morning. So bow your heads with me. The message this morning is that Jesus loves us and He's turned around and He's given His face to us to show that He accepts us and He approves of us no matter what. So first of all, I want to give an invitation that if you have never met Jesus... You've lived a life of sin and in your heart in this moment, this morning, that you feel that I'm not right with God. And you don't know how you could be right with God. That He's already forgiven you of your sins. It's not a matter of earning God's forgiveness. He he gave it out freely. It's just a matter of whether you step forward and you take it. And second of all this morning, before I give an invitation, as a believer in Christ, it's so easy to to fall into religious traps of how we approach God. It's so easy to believe that God wants to to judge us or, or, or come against us. That if we mess up, that we have to start all over again and that we have to do some crazy act of penance. And we're walking around flogging ourselves on the back, beating ourselves up because we've messed up. Or because we weren't praying enough or our marriage isn't good enough or our children aren't following Christ. But that's a lie. That is a lie this morning. So as we pray this morning, I do want to give the invitation if you, want to, if you want that deeper relationship with Christ, and I know we all do, but if you feel like you need to step out into the acceptance and look Jesus full on the face, I want to invite for you to be able to come up this morning. So I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray. If you want to pray this morning, I'll pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, we thank You so much that this morning that the glory of God through Jesus Christ, through His face, is shining down upon us because You've looked at us, because You've given us Your approval this morning. So God, I pray that as we go throughout this week, God, that You would change the way that we approach life, change the way that we approach people, change the way that we approach our marriages and our children, and the way that we approach our devotions, because God, we know that You've approved us. God, we know that You've forgiven us. God, that You are there for us. And so we don't have to be afraid uh, of judgment because You've promised that You wouldn't do that to us, God. So I pray that this morning that we could leave here and in Your words be encouraged. Amen. This morning I want you to be encouraged in Jesus Christ because He's here for you. And Your faith has made us whole. Your faith has made You whole. My faith has made me whole. We are in Christ. And being hidden in Christ... We are seen as Christ. Amen. Amen, Pastor. It's a powerful message to to contemplate and to think about and to keep in your heart and pray about over this week. One of the worst things you can do is to get in that place where you, you think you know, God's judging you and, and looking down on you. If God, if that's, you know, if that's the way God was, He would have never sent Jesus. Jesus, you know, again, as, as we've seen clearly today, shows us God's love. It's a powerful thing to contemplate. Don't, don't let the enemy get in your mind and tell you how, you know, you know, how God doesn't do these things. This is exactly what we need to hear. Father, we thank you today and Father, I pray that you would just stick this, uh, uh, this truth into our hearts, that your word would, you know, Jesus, you are the word, and, and you are that essence of, of God's love. And, and, you know, Jesus, you came to connect with us. You didn't want to be a God far off. And that's what the Old Testament taught us, you know, that it was to push us to this day to where we could be in, in, a, in a current a beautiful relationship with God to where we talk and we share and 
you know, Lord, this is the beauty. You know, you didn't give us religion. You gave us life. And Lord, man is, man is what has turned this beautiful thing into religion and, and rules. And, you know, Lord, yeah, there are rules in the kingdom. But Jesus, it's about that connection with you. And if we get that connection with you right, and we see you face to face and, 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 and look upon you as you want us to do, Lord, that, that helps us to, to adjust all of our living. And so, Father, as we head out of this building today, uh, Lord, I pray that we would go with this truth anchored in our hearts, that we are, that we are uh, uh, what you long for. You, you long for that relationship with us, Father. There's no one too bad. Like I was saying at the beginning, there's no one too bad. There's no one too far gone that this message can't change. There's no one who sins so much. I, I know I was talking to somebody years ago, Lord, who, who said, if I went to a church, it would probably catch on fire. Uh, but Jesus, that's something the enemy puts into our minds so that we won't receive the connection that we can have through Jesus Christ. And so, Father, stir our hearts to remember this. And Lord, if anybody still at this moment is being dealt with, Lord, let them find myself or Brandon and just talk to us after the service because Lord, this is something that could change our lives if we'll receive it. Now Lord, as we go, let us go in your name and your power, your strength, and we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget there's coffee around the corner if you want to chat for a while. This is Pastor Maxi. We really appreciate you watching our video today. Please feel free to share it, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. If you want more information about our church, please give us a call at 804-224-9375.